So uh, thanks for making it to the end of the conference. Um, I am planning to tell you about two results, actually. The first one is generic local Hamiltonians are gapless. But the result is simple enough that I think I can cover it fairly fast. And then I'll tell you about a technique on obtaining the eigenvalues of sums of matrices using free probability theory and you know, random matrix theory and standard probability theory. But you know, we'll see. I, as I wrote in the abstract, I said time permitting. I'll discuss the second topic, OK? So I'll cover the first, and you know, we go from there. For those of you who just arrived, nothing has happened yet. So generic local Hamiltonians are gapless. Well, we know a lot. So when, so when you have a generic operator, you can ask questions. The first questions are, what do we know about their eigenvalues and eigenvectors? right? And throughout this talk, everything is going to be Hermitian. Not that it needs mentioning in such an audience, but everything is Hermitian. So you know, we know about this Wigner semicircle law, which plays the role of central limit theorem. We know that even the edge statistics, they've told me to use the mouse, but I think it will slow me down. So the edge statistics is governed by tracy Witham laws. A lot is known. And actually, it's mostly pure mathematics these days about working with really dense, large, uh, random matrices and understanding their statistics. But then you can ask, well, how relevant are these results for physical systems? If you have, for example, a Hamiltonian, a local Hamiltonian of some sort, um, then you know, do, do these universality results really hold or apply in the case of a local Hamiltonian, for example? So we have to ask, out in, this generic, in this generic world, what is physical? So some things we have learned is that for example, our Hamiltonians, our, our operators, are not just some like gigantic Gaussian matrix. What they are are that they're sums of, they're sums of little, so say four by four Hermitian matrices that don't commute. But together, it's an exponentially large operator. But the number of random parameters going in grows linearly or you know on a square lattice quadratically with the number of local terms. So that's one thing. So the, it's even if, even if these guys are generic, H is highly non-generic. It just doesn't have enough random parameters. Second, and so this is a pictorial way of writing this, we have like near local interactions. So in physics, many condensed matter systems or uh, spin chains, et cetera, we have local interactions. Another thing is that we don't care about most of the universality results in random matrix theory hold in the bulk. We, in, in physical systems, we care about the ground state properties. It just turns out that uh, bulk of matter is usually in its ground state. So we care about the lowest energy, and so that's the lowest energy and the corresponding ground state, the lowest eigenvector. And yes, clearly it's important, the distance to the next eigenstate, the first excited state. That's called the gap, that positive distance. And why is the gap important? Well, I'll tell you why the gap is important. But the, the fact, you know, if you have a system that's gapped, versus gapless in the limit as the system size goes to infinity, that has strong implications that we'll explore. But just to tell you, so you see this, this problem, even if you have generic interactions, is far less generic than the things that we can prove. These are like 21st century, pure mathematicians are really excited about these things. You know, proving things are universal, et cetera. But there are little, um, you do read papers once in a while that they try to make these results sound like they apply here, but they just don't. So then you can ask, well, Given these constraints, what are the generic properties? So suppose I do confine to this physical subset, what can I say generically? So there's a, there's a lot you can say. I've contributed a little bit to this. Um, so for example, the density of states of generic spin chains, we could obtain them. Th this will be kind of covered in the second part of the talk if I get to it, from free probability and uh, standard probability theory. Um, and Connected to the open problem I told you about, we have an understanding of the frustration freeness, ground state degeneracy of generic spin chains, um, et cetera. But today, I'm going to talk about the gap, the gap that positive distance between the first two eigenvalues of generic local Hamiltonians, OK? So what, what is, um, and you know, I usually ask what do you guys think, but the title gives it away. So generically, and generically mathematics means with probability one, we'll prove that these systems are gapless and actually a stronger notion will prove that there is a continuous density of states sitting on top of the ground state, okay? So it's the strong notion of gaplessness. Um, 
So I'm going to define what I just said. So every finite system is gapped. Do you agree? I mean, if you have a finite system, you have a finite spectrum, and if you ignore degeneracies, which we should if we're going to talk about the gap, then you, know, you have a discrete set of eigenvalues. There's a gap, right? But the question. So why do you neglect uh, degeneracy? Uh, I, don't, I don't want to call that gapless. I, I really want to call something gapless where you see, like, you say something. So gaplessness is, for example, um, a requirement for quantum phase transitions. And those only occur in the thermodynamical limit, right? So I want to ignore the degeneracy because I don't want to make my life so simple. I want to really prove whether the first um, eigenstate does coalesce in the limit, okay? It's just, um, I don't want to combine the two problems at one. So we're ignoring finite size degeneracies. We want to ask if the second eigenvalue and first eigenvalue in the limit, if they do stay a constant apart as you take the system size to infinity, we say the system is gapped. It's gapped. If they go, if they coalesce in the limit, we say the system is gapless. But there's a stronger notion of gaplessness, and that is not only this guy coalesces, there's a continuum of there's a continuum of states. You know, there's, you can find a finite interval where every point is epsilon close to an eigenvalue. So it's, it's really continuous here. Okay, so these are the notions of gaplessness. And well, you know, why should you care? Well, like I said, for quantum phase transitions, gaplessness is a requirement. Uh, in this audience, it hardly needs motivation. Um, gap and correlation functions are intimately connected. We have good reasons to believe that gap systems are easier to simulate on a classical computer, certainly the case in one dimension where gap local Hamiltonians obey an area law, et cetera. So gap is important. Fine, fine, gap is important. And in a, in a recent result, it was shown that, you know, the general gap problem is undecidable. So it's a, the spectral gap problem, for those who have worked on it, is usually a very hard problem. Like if you have a model that describes a certain system, Usually the bottleneck in your mathematical physics paper is to go and prove the gap. You know, is it gap, is it not? If it's not, how does it scale, et cetera? Um, and it is so much so that, you know, like a very recent result, 2015, shows that if you have a rank one projectors on a spin chain, qubits, then you can quantify the gap and gapless phases. It's just that the problem, and it's for a translationally invariant system here. Um, so it's just to tell you that the problem is usually tends to be really hard. But it turns out when you add um, genericity in local terms, you can just do so much. So much comes out of um, the fact that you have independent random terms. And you can uh, solve the problem on like many dimensions, et cetera. So all right, the, the setting is, the setting is I, have, I have a local Hamiltonian. OK, so this is not working. Um, so on top, I have a local Hamiltonian where i, j are nearest neighbors, say. They don't have to be. It could be k local, whatever. And on whatever, lattice, graph. But I just want to have um, finite maximum degree, right? I don't want to have something that's everybody's connected to everybody, like a mean field theory or something. Just, you know. Is that exponential degree? Hmm? Is it, is it uh, perhaps. I don't know. I, I like to think of them as like finite random matrices locally. Um, Maybe that could be an approximation of something that does have an exponential decay. But I want to have random local terms, independent of one another, and notion of locality. Okay? And, you know, like, what are some examples of this? Well, you know, the local terms could be, so HIJs, the little matrices, can be from a GUE, GOE. Or they could be random projectors with eigenvalue 0, 1. Um, and, you know, or more general things. So the, the easiest case in the proof is when you can have local terms. So I'm going to tell you about the idea of the proof. So we're going to prove that it's gapless, but how? So there is an assumption where eigenvalues of a local term, they have a, they have a positive probability to be all epsilon close to each other. OK? So very small, but positive probability. And you might th say, well, you know, is that really possible? Well, it is. Like, for example, a Wigner-type matrix, a GUE matrix, uh, is of this sort, where A is a Gaussian matrix, you know, totally independent, 
entries, and you symmetrize it this way. And if A happens to be near identity, well, you know, your local term is near identity, or some multiple of identity. And under this assumption, so this is the simplest case. I want to give you an intuition about this notion of rare local regions that have existed in um, theory of disorder systems for 50 years. Um, under this assumption, it's possible to have, with a positive probability, a local term, just one local term, whose two smallest eigenvalues are epsilon close for any arbitrarily epsilon. And everybody overlapping with it is um, clo epsilon close to a multiple of identity. Okay? So it's a very rare event. But there's a possibility. There's a positive probability of doing that. And then using this and while inequality, um, it's, it's Easy to, so what happens here is that this local term basically decouples from the rest of the system, right? So you basically have this tensor the rest of the system. And this local gapless condition is protected in the large Hamiltonian. So the, the physics jargon is that you have um, arbitrarily small ex local excitations. So you have one region with epsilon gap and it adds to the ground state of what so write the eigenvalues of this and the rest is a direct sum. If this is epsilon close, the eigenvalue, the ground state of what remains is this plus the two small eigenvalues. So that, that's the notion of the gaplessness for the whole Hamiltonian. Does that make sense? Um, so, and then, you know, a question I get is, well, can you prove something about the gap being, how does the gap scale, right? Somebody could say, how does the gap scale? Does that make sense? Uh, uh, so sure. You're talking about a single local term yeah. uh, of the Hamiltonian. Yeah. And what does this therefore imply about the full Hamiltonian? Right. So, um, so you have, there are two things happening. There is a very small probability of two things happening. One, there will be one term that has degeneracy, close to degeneracy, epsilon close to degeneracy. Okay, it's, it can happen. The first two eigenvalues. So there are, say, four eigenvalues here because it's a four by four. The first two are very close. Okay? Then there is another thing happening independent of this because local terms are independent. And that is all the terms, H's, that are overlapping with this. So this is a four by four matrix here, four by four matrix here, four by four matrix up there. Those happen to be, happen to have eigenvalues that are all epsilon close. So all four of them are epsilon close. Okay, so you're almost, pro you're epsilon close to something proportional to the identity matrix. And that enables you to write the eigenvalue of the full Hamiltonian as the direct, as a sum of eigenvalues of everybody plus HPQ. And that's the source of local, arbitrarily small local excitation that gets protected. Okay, thanks for asking. Um, so then, you know, a question you ask, you get is that, you know, is the gap universal? Can you calculate the scaling of the gap with the system size? It turns, the question is not very well defined because it really depends on the distribution of H's. I mean, if they're random projectors, if they're GUEs, if they're whatever, I mean, you'll get a different eigenvalue statistics. And no, it's not universal, right? You might not be able to get something that's proportional to identity. For example, if you have projectors, the eigenvalues are zero, one. You'll never have two eigenvalues that are epsilon close. Right? So you need something else. So the notion, the gaplessness and scaling of the gap is not something universal. But if you do have local terms, sorry guys, if you do have local terms that are distributed according to the, you know, the, 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 the workhorse of random matrix theory, Gaussian unitary ensemble or Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, then you can actually calculate it. So suppose it is the case, uh, my local terms are distributed according to GUE or you know, symplectic, whatever. This is the measure on the matrices if M of N is an N by N matrix. And then you ask, the first question you ask is, what is the probability? So N, think of N here as four for, for, for local terms that are on qubits. Uh, what's the probability of one of the local terms to be um, close, you know, within a ball of radius epsilon from some A, A is a real number, some multiple of identity, okay? Then you can, you know, you integrate it and you get this. Then you say, well, what's the probability if I include all the A's? So that is, 
you know, my local term is epsilon close to some multiple of identity, right? And it has the same scaling with epsilon. So in the case of qubits, again, I remind you, that would be epsilon to two squared four, right? So the probability of having one local term being epsilon close to identity goes as epsilon to the number of entries of the matrix. And then, um, then you can ask, well, so, so let's, let's just do an example. Suppose I want a lattice where the coordinate number is z. So on a line, z is two. Coordinate number means number of nearest neighbors. Um, or number of overlapping terms. So there will be z, they're independent events. z, d to the four, overlapping terms, all of which should be proportional to multiple identity. And there's another result that's much more general that says the, the probability of having the first two eigenvalues epsilon close goes as epsilon to the degeneracy squared, so two squared. So that's the source of this, this four. Well, if this is the probability, then you ask, you know, when is the expected probability one, right? So you, you, you do realize such a local term. You with me? So you do realize such a local term was well, one over this, and n goes, n, so n, the, the number of terms in the summation would have to be this big, which means epsilon as a function of n has the scaling, okay? So this is not a bound, you can just calculate it. If, you know, I don't know, if you don't follow the technicality here, it's okay. The, you get the point though, right? There is a, you can calculate it in this case, and this is the scaling. Um, but if you relax the assumption of all the eigenvalues being epsilon close, which is something we do care about in quantum information theory. For example, if you have random projectors, which are important for the satisfiability problem, like QSAT, and you know, for frustration, free systems are naturally represented in terms of uh, um, um, sums of projectors. Then what? I mean, then eigenvalues cannot be all epsilon close because you have rank R, which means R of them are one. D squared minus R is zero. <laughs> there is no epsilon close. So you will have different types of local regions. For example, so you can prove that they're gapless and the type of local regions you have will look like this. For example, you have a projector. So you agree if this is a projector, this is a projector, right? Like I, I tensor a projector is a projector. So if this has some rank, we'll have two times that rank as the rank of the projector here. And there is a probability that this term here, so this is d by d, this is d by d, together they're d squared by d squared. So d is like two, right? I, I think of q dits, like q bits. So whenever I say d, you can think of two if you want to think in terms of bits. So this, is a, this together is four by four, this is two by two, this is two by two. Um, and if it happens that the projector pi acts on this side and identity acts on some site, R zero, some point in the lattice, and its neighbor does the exact opposite, pi acts on this, I acts on this, then that one side decouples. You basically have the, the, the Hilbert space here, tensor, a Hamiltonian, and everybody else. Okay? And again, every eigenvalue gets a twofold, becomes twofold degenerate. Because you know, there you have a Hilbert space that's C2 here. And similarly in higher dimensions, there would have to be an identity on one particular side and projectors would have to act on, on the neighbors. Again, you get a default degeneracy. And if you're epsilon close to this, then you can say yes, you know, such a rare local region can appear. You can be epsilon close to use while inequality and you prove it that indeed the total Hamiltonian will then be, uh, be gapless with probability one. Um, now, a couple of remarks I wanna make. One is that, all right, that shows that the first two eigenvalues coalesce in the limit, right? As I make the system size very large, there's this local gap that gets preserved, right? But I told you earlier on that we can actually prove there's a continuous density of states above the ground state. So that means not only two eigenvalues coalesce, there's a system size dependent number of eigenvalues that kind of pile up on the ground state. Well, how do you do that? Well, take n large enough that with probability one, you have one of these. Well, then take another n larger, you'll have another one of these, and larger, and you have another one of these, right? So as you make the system larger and larger, there will be a smaller and smaller, but positive probability of realizing these various local regions. And they will contribute, then you have to, you know, push your epsilon deltas, of course, it's not, just that, you have to prove, for example, there is a constant C, some inner ball right above the ground state in which every point is epsilon close to an eigenvalue. So there's dense set of eigenvalues inside, right? 
And you can do that, right? I mean, it's, it's in the paper, you can look up and you can do that. Um, so a couple of remarks, probability of a rare local region is really a function of the local distribution. So it's, you know, if somebody asks, you know, is the gap scaling universal? No, I don't think it's universal, okay? So it depends. If there are GUEs, yes, you can quantify it, but you know, for projectors, I, I don't know how it scales. Um, and another thing I want to mention is that this, the, the way the proofs go, and I say this because it might be insightful for people who want to make such proofs, you can never prove gaplessness using perturbation theory. So for example, if I said, you know, these are epsilon close to an eigenvalue, uh, and you said, well, to the first order perturbation theory, um, the, the, what used to be degenerate becomes degenerate plus epsilon times some corrections, right? So the gap must be epsilon small. Do you see what I mean? So, so the local term is epsilon close to a multiple of identity. Uh, no, sorry, the epsilon close to a degenerate. There was one HPQ, if you recall, whose first two eigenvalues were epsilon close to being equal, epsilon close to each other. You could see this backwards. Say there is an HPQ whose two eigenvalues are exactly equal, and I'm epsilon perturbing this, okay? In which case the eigenvalues should move using first order perturbation theory is gonna be just the same plus epsilon times some correction. The issue with using, for per using perturbation theory for proving gaplessness is that if you do this, then you have to prove that in the second, third, fourth order perturbation theory, a gap, a constant gap doesn't appear. Now why? Well, you know, in perturbation theory, you'll have your energy is going to be E0 unperturbed plus um, epsilon E1 plus epsilon squared E2, where these guys you got to calculate, right? This is the unperturbed, this is the unperturbed, uh, degenerate eigenvalue. So it's true that you have a power series expansion in epsilon, but these corrections, for those who have worked with the perturbation theory, as you take the order higher and higher, they grow combinatorially. You know, you have sums, so you have, you know, if this is the kth order perturbation, you have k minus one sums over all these uh, enumerators, eigenvectors, denominator, you have lambda i minus lambda j's, et cetera. So then you would have to prove that none of these constants catch up. They're combinatorially many. You have to prove that none of these constants catch up to kill this epsilon square scaling. This is small, but this could become so big that opens up a constant gap at higher orders. That's why you know, perturbation theory is not a good way to prove gaplessness. But using wild inequality, you can do it. Um, and so what are the limitations of what I showed you? Well, first, the message is that, you see, look, with independent random with independence, with probabilistic methods, you can do so much. It's just that like the best result we have for translationally invariant systems, that means strictly every term is equal, right? So there's a term, you copy, and the best we had was a spin chain of, you know, qubits with rank one projectors, and this is a 2015 result. And the problem is undecidable, et cetera. But as soon as you introduce the notion of genericity, it all breaks into pieces. So not only you can solve it in any dimension, any graph, prove gaplessness in the strongest term possible, so there's continuous density of states. Just so much comes out of this probabilistic, uh, this independence. The fact that we can take local terms of independence and push the expectations, et cetera. So that's the message, but the that's also a limitation of this work in that even if I pick one term generically and then copy it, so I make it strictly transitionally invariant, then this doesn't work because you know, then you have to come and prove that um, right, so everybody would have to be epsilon close to an identity or something. So it just doesn't work, right? I'm using the fact that the nearest neighbor term are all. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about gaplessness. Um, I could tell you about this new result that just got posted last night. So it should be on your archive. Um, we have a because it's an entirely different result. Yeah. So um, I'm not a physicist, but speaking with physicists, I got this impression that you, when you have like gapless system, one of the signature we're expecting is that the state has this long range correlation. It can, yes. And now somehow you like model to like the finite has with probability one, one spin which is the coupling of all of them. So you can't actually show uh, well my question is I can probably construct an Hamiltonian which has this state as a ground state and is gap. So this ground state of this gapless Hamiltonian 
I was with you till the very last statement. Um, I don't know if I really understand. So, um, so two things. One, I want to comment about what you just said. Um, it's true that gaplessness often, so if you want to have long range correlations, you need gaplessness. So in particular, existence of a gap implies an exponentially decaying correlation, but not the other way around. So if you do have a gapless system, it doesn't imply that you necessarily have long range correlations, though it does happen in many examples. You see what I mean? So it's not, a, it's not an equivalent statement. This is an example where the rare local region is actually local. So it's not really correlated with the rest of the system, yet it causes the gaplessness. It's the source of gaplessness. So you know, Anderson localization theory, if you study it, these things is not, um, or many body localization Hamiltonians, if you look at that literature, this notion of rare local regions have existed for some time. Um, so that's the comment, and your question I don't quite understand. If you want to, we can talk about it now or maybe after. Do you want to maybe talk about it after? So you like the ground state. Okay. And, 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 I, and I, I wonder like, how this, like, the connection with like, phase transition is, 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 is not that whether two states are ground states of a gapless Hamiltonian, it's whether you can find a gapless Hamiltonian. That's how we define phase transition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know. I, I'll have to think more about it. I, to me, it's like, you know, I have, a, I have a Hamiltonian, then I talk about its state. You're going backwards. You're saying I have a state, I'm going to find a Hamiltonian. So um, let me not comment on it just yet, all right? Um, so any other questions that are pressing? Okay, so this is a, previously it was proofs, but this is gonna be a, more of an applied math talk. We have something that works really well. We don't quite understand why it works really well. And I hope that you guys who are like mathematically seasoned are gonna go and prove why it works really well. All right, so there's mathematical opportunities here, but it's also a very powerful applied technique it seems. I mean, it works every time we use it. Uh, you might have heard some earlier versions of this in terms of uh, spin chains, but now you know it's a ge more general. Uh, we have a more general encompassing theory that applies to general sums of matrices. All right, so eigenvalue approximation of sums of self-adjoint matrices from eigenvector localization delocalization. That's the title. I'll have to explain everything. Okay. So you know there's a. All right, so guys, this is a new talk. Right, so you can like. You know, take a deep breath and just take it as a new talk. Um, suppose you have two matrices, M1 and M2. And you know the eigenvalues of M1, and you know the eigenvalues of M2. And you know, you go to your linear algebra class and you say, all right, students, what is the eigenvalue distribution of M1 plus M2? So any takers? So if some student says it's just the sum of the eigenvalues of M1 and M2, they're not doing very well, right? In that, you know, they may not commute. I mean, if they commute, you could simultaneously diagonalize and add eigenvalues. But in general, it's a very difficult problem, right? I mean, the reason, the reason quantum chemistry is difficult is that the Laplacian is diagonalizable in the Fourier basis, the potential often in the real basis, you put them together, and it's difficult, right? Like, we have to do DMRG, we have to do all sorts of things. And, you know, like, if you look at the spin chain, something I worked on earlier on, you know, you have a sum of local Hamiltonians on a spin chain, for example, you can write as sums of odd interactions plus even interactions. Everybody in here commutes, everybody in here commutes, so individually this guy is easy, this guy is easy. When you put them together, because nearest neighbor, the consecutive terms don't commute, it becomes very difficult. They're not simultaneously diagonalizable. Or, you know, if you have a noisy system, you have M that you understand, and you add a perturbation to it. Well, you know, or small or strong perturbation. Then, you know, the eigenvalue, eigenpairs of the sum is not easily understood. 
et cetera. So there is this question, the general question was posed, you know, generally if you have two uh, matrices whose eigenvalues you know, whether the eigenvalues, all possible eigenvalues of the sum, was posed by Hermann Weyl in 1912. It gave rise to a lot of nice mathematics, like Horn's conjecture, which gives you an you know, overcomplete set of recursive inequalities. Then Horn's conjecture got promoted to a theorem because Kliashko proved it. And you know, it was cleaned up and really you know, made pretty by Knudsen and Tao. Um, so all of these give you bounds, like you get some bounds on what the eigenvalues of the sum, you know, you get a convex hall, for example, that you know, in which the eigenvalues should reside, et cetera. But you know, this is nice that you get some bounds on what the eigenvalues of sums should be. But despite the great success, there are not many results that enable you to draw a picture on a computer, right? I mean, you have the distribution of M1, you have the distribution of M2. A physicist wants to know if you have a singularity, if it's decaying in the tail, if it has a bump in the middle. So you want to you get an accurate picture of the density of the sum. So I want to, so having said this, I want to make the problem crisp, tell you, you know, uh, what the assumptions are. Suppose we have two matrices, M1 and M2, self-adjoint. Um, and find the eigenvalues of M1 plus M2. So M1, I can always do an eigenvalue decomposition, right? So these are eigenvectors, and A is a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues. Similarly here, I can change bases by making A diagonal, in which case QS will be QB times QA inverse here, right? All right, so this is my problem. I have a diagonal matrix plus some difficult, weirdly uh, eigenvectors times some another diagonal matrix. I'm conjugating with this eigenvector matrix, okay? And then I ask, you know, what are the eigen, so, and you agree this was a similarity transformation. So eigenvalues of this are equal to the eigenvalues of this sum. So. so under the assumptions that, so A1 is a diagonal matrix, B1 is a diagonal matrix, this question is not possible to answer without some knowledge of eigenvectors, right? Because Q could be anything. It's a very hard problem. But with, with the following assumptions, we get something that we can push pretty far and in practice, it works, works well. Suppose A and B are independent, and they have some randomness. They don't have to be like Gaussians or whatever, but they, they have some randomness that I can talk about exp, you know, uh, the expected eigenvalue, right? So I wanna, I wanna draw a distribution, right? They have some randomness. And QS, this, this object, is permutationally invariant, but it doesn't have to be hard. This is not like a, you know, strong random matrix problem. And permutation invariance, you know, classical problems can be permutation invariant. I mean, all, all you need to get a permutation invariance is to conjugate by a permutation matrix, right? So QS is permutationally invariant, but not hard. Um, then the goal, the result is that I'll give you a way to draw on a computer the eigenvalue distribution of the sum, okay? Can you prove it converges in whatever norm? I don't know, but it works very well when we test it empirically against many problems. Okay, so I want to tell you how to do this. Okay? Um, so we have this problem, and it, so beta equals one is real, two is complex, four is symplectic, it's the general beta business. And I'm taking my matrices to be M by M, Mary times Mary, M by M. So the number of random parameters going in is little O of you know, beta M squared for, for Q, okay? Because you know, it could be some whatever, right? The number of parameters needed with the, with the unitary uh, symmetry is gonna be this much. So the exact problem is very difficult. How can we approximate it? The dumbest approximation would be to say, well, ignore non-commutativity. Suppose you can simultaneously diagonalize both. So it's like a classical answer. Suppose everybody commutes. In which case you have A plus a permutation matrix, inverse B permutation matrix. So all this does is that it permutes the eigenvalues of B. But you're adding two diagonal matrices. Just work out where they are and you get the sum, okay? That's the so-called classical answer. And the permutation matrix, as you know, has uh, entry zero, one, right? So there's a one in every one column. Okay, but you know, if I have the density of this and I have the density of this, and this connects to uh, the talk uh, Camille gave, 
um, then the density of the sum is just a convolution because they're, they're the simultaneous and diagonalizable. Just a standard classical convolution, multivariate. There is another um, extreme that I guess in this audience more people know about it, but you know, like in many audiences they don't, and that's the free probability answer. So this connects to Spike here's talk and some of the talks yesterday, Jamie and others, which I was happy to learn some new techniques for calculating, uh, where you know you have a Q that is totally random. I mean it's unitary or orthogonal, but otherwise it's hard measure. Okay? It's like that you decouple the eigenvalues fully. It turns out that this answer also can be obtained using a free convolution, which is something uh, Roland Speicher defined yesterday, and there were some discussions about it, and you know, they have a new technique for calculating it even with, with good accuracy. So, fine, so as far as the parameter counting goes, it seems like any realistic problem is kind of in between. All right, it's very difficult, it's, I don't know, like MP complete and et cetera. So, you know, we're not gonna solve it exactly, but maybe, and that's the idea that we tested and it seems to work every time we apply it, maybe this is either fully, actually in many examples, this, even for small sizes, you can fake it to be this and you get similar answers. For many examples, we feel like if you just fake it, like if you let QS be Q, totally hard, the density of the sum you get is fairly accurately matching just the free convolution of the two. But when it doesn't, we have realized that a convex combination of two ends work really well. All right? So there's a P param, so all right, so this is a little cheesy slide. You know, I have a slider that takes P from zero to one, and there's an appropriate P that tells you, you know, how to mix the two ends to get the right, to get the right sum. How do you find P? So if this is the density of the sum, there's P times density of the free plus one minus P times the density of uh, classical. Why? Well, I don't know why, it just works, all right? We take a complex combination, it works. Should it be linear interpolation? Should it be nonlinear? I don't know, we take linear and it works. So it's just an idea, all right? So it's something that turns out to work. Um, and it turns out, as I'll show you, that the most natural P is gonna be one, so if you've heard of inverse participation ratio, P will depend on the localization. So let QS be an entry. M is the size of the matrix. M times expected entry to the four. Well, first of all, if this were squared, this would be just one over M and the whole thing would be zero. Okay, I'll show you, I'll show you what I mean. So uh, let U be any eigenvector matrix. So, you know, matrix of eigenvectors. You do agree that because they're normalized, this sum is one, right? So it's like, if you sum over just J, you get one, and there's M of them, one over M1. Uh, so, you know, this square is not gonna tell you much, and you don't take odd powers because of the sign. So physicists have taught us that if you wanna understand the localization of an eigenvector, you look at the so-called inverse, inverse participation ratio. And that is the same formula as here where you take the fourth power, all right? And note that, you know, for example, if your U is totally totally, totally spread out, right? It's all ones, one over root m's. If it's all spread out, you get m times one over m squared. This is the, I'm taking an empirical expectation, and you know, I have one over m's, and it just comes out of one over m. If it's totally localized, this will be exactly, uh, what will it be actually? It will be, is this right, one over, uh, one M. Yeah, that's right. So there will be there will be a one from every row, and there's M of them, M over M squared, one over M, and there's an M here. So you see it goes to one. Inverse participation ratio will be one for the very localized eigenstates, and for very spread out ones, it'll go to zero. Or it'll go as one over the system size. So it goes to zero as the size goes to infinity. Okay? And it turns out the P we we have uh, the P that you need to choose depends on the inverse participation ratio of the QS, that difficult object that we cannot, you know, source of difficulty. So, so one minus the inverse participation ratio, right? It turns out. And why, again, it just works. Why don't we try, okay? So maybe you can prove why. So let me just give you one example. This is from like a way back where we applied this to spin chains. Some of you may have 
known this, and that is, you know, so red dots are result of exact diagonalization of a spin chain problem. And so here I take the odd interactions and even interactions as my M1 and M2, okay? Then if you look at the classical case, in which case you just take the eigenvalues and you assume, you know, you can just add eigenvalues, you get the, you get the, you get, you get, you get the dash, do you guys, can you see from back there? You get the dashed gray curve here. See, it doesn't really, so gold standard are the red dots. You see, you get the dash, yeah, it works out here, fails kind of everywhere else. And the free answer where, you know, you get A, B, and you replace the QS with a totally hard unitary, totally hard, will be given by this gray solid curve. We call it isotropic because it works for finite cases. Free probability theory is an infinite technology. But, you know, the isotropic is the finite version of free. Um, and you see it doesn't really work all that well. But the complex combination, and here I think P is 0.43. You see, nails it, right? Basically nails it. And here is a little bit off its histogramming issue. There wasn't enough points. But it really nails it, right? And it's a full eigenvalue distribution. It's not some ground state. Well, it's all the eigenvalues, probability. And it's a true density, like that sum, it sums to one. If you look at here, like 0 0.05, it goes to 40. Imagine it's a triangle, the area is one. Um, so I have, so that's the technique and this is a result. I have three minutes. I can tell you more or I don't think I should tell you a whole lot more. Um, I tell you one cool, and we can prove actually that P's so you might ask, is there always a convex combination? Okay, so let me tell you then in words, let me tell you what I want to tell you. Um, oh, well, okay, that was. Um, so let me tell you in words. Um, you might say, well, how do you find P? We could prove that the classical, the actual problem, and the free, you know, there are the three versions with those three balls I had, the world, and if you, you might say, well, how am I gonna find P? Maybe you can look at moments. See, you know, go via moments. You calculate the first moment of each three problems, you realize they're equal. Yeah, you're, okay, fine. I mean, the first moment of everything is a Gaussian. You look at the second moments, they're all equal. Again, you know, anything with two moments is a Gaussian. But we looked at the third moment, they were equal. So the first three moments of your problem and the two extremes match. Then you calculate the fourth moment. You calculate the fourth moment, so that's the fourth moment of free, classical, and your actual problem, and you realize they're not equal. You say, okay, maybe I use, maybe I, maybe I write the fourth moment that I analytically calculated for my hard problem as a convex combination of these two extremes that I can calculate, and this defines a P for me. You know, if I go via moments, it's the first time that they differ. And you find it, I mean, I gave a talk once, somebody came up to me and said, look, I followed everything, but I just didn't understand what happened here. How did you get a P? Well, it's one equation, one variable. So you just solve for P, okay? Because everything else you've done by hand, by hand. Um, and it turns out once you use this P and you sum the two extreme densities using this P, which you got from fourth moment matching, you get answers that are far more accurate than you would expect from just the first four moments. It just turns out that it works. I mean, I could tell you more about why I think, you know, this is the case or what have you, but let me not. And sometimes, sorry guys, this picture should, should not have been truncated. Um, this, this is supposed to be much smaller. So, and often, so the message is that often free probability works very well. For example, for, Rand, for Anderson model, um, P equals one really nails the density fairly well. This is not the best representation, but uh, yeah, uh, this, I should have seen the scaling before doing this. And when P equals one doesn't work, a fourth moment matching technique I told you about, in everything we've tried, works really well, okay? So that's the conclusion, that's really the conclusion of this talk. So either, you know, the free probability gives you the right answer, or some p weight complex combination of free and classical nails the density of states. So there are two good questions that I have for you. One is, where can you apply this? 
you might say, well, eigenvalues are everywhere. I can apply it anywhere. But really sit and think about it. Where can you apply it? That would be great to see. Uh, so we applied it to, for example, spin chains with generic interactions, Anderson model. Um, but you know, I suspect there is more you can do. Um, second is, can you make things more rigorous? I mean, we have theorems that gets us to the fourth moment matching, but can you prove something about why it works really well? That'd be nice to see. Or you know, maybe add some other assumptions and prove why it works really well. That'd be a start. Okay. So with this, maybe I stop, and maybe it's a good time to stop and take questions. <laughs>